All right, looks like we are live. So welcome everybody. Um, today I'd like to introduce Israel Klich, uh, who is going to be giving us a talk titled Stirring by Staring. Um, so with that, uh, please get started. All right. Uh, okay, thanks for, uh, guys for inviting me to, to talk. Um, uh, so this work is uh, a collaboration with various people, but I would say most of all uh, uh, with my student uh, Matthew Wampler, who is uh, responsible of, for many of the beautiful results uh, I'm going to show you. Um, and the theme of the, uh, I'll show you two uh, cool things that you can do by combining, um, by, by taking a kind of boring quantum, boring system, and then doing something with measurements, which are repeated in a certain way. Uh, so I'll run through two examples and show you, um, a, so this power of quantum measurement that allows you to do things that uh, are kind of um, um, non-equilibrium states that are kind of unusual. It's an, if you want, it's another way of, creating a messier <laughs> or, or more uh, elaborate uh, uh, systems. So, um, so I'll uh, start with, uh, a, with um, what will motivate about half of the talk is uh, this nice, so since we're going to be talking about non-equilibrium uh, systems, uh, there is a class of non-equilibrium systems that are very nice and have been studied very extensively in, in, uh, in the last years, and that is what are called topological, floquet topological insulators. So these systems are systems where you take a quantum system, maybe electrons hopping on a lattice, and then you uh, engage a time-dependent uh, but periodic uh, modulation of the Hamiltonian, and uh, under certain conditions, you can, you can look at the kind of uh, the steady state of the evolution per, per period, which are called Floquet states. And then sometimes these Floquet states will have interesting topological properties. Uh, there are many, many works on that, but the, the one that we will engage with is this nice toy model that kind of really captures a lot of what uh, uh, these kind of Floquet systems can do. And it's a very simple thing. Uh, so let me quickly explain it. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Can you see my mouse? Probably not. Yes, we can. Ah, you can. Oh, great. Okay. So, uh, so this is a paper by, uh, by uh, Rudner, Lindner, uh, Berg, and Levin from already almost 10 years ago. And what they do is uh, the following. They say, okay, let's look at uh, just a plain vanilla square lattice. And we are going to do a protocol, so time dependent protocol for um, our Hamiltonian, uh, which looks like this. So there are several steps. In step number one, you uh, turn only hopping along these red connections. Yeah? Um, so if you started from a particle that sits, say, on this uh, um, white dot, uh, ah, and you tune the time uh, in which you evolve under this step one, so that if you start from uh, this dot, this white dot, you will hop to the black dot with kind of probability one. Um, so you do that. Then you turn off this coupling, this, uh, and, and you turn off the blue couplings, the blue hoppings. Uh, and then the green ones and the yellow ones, and then back to the red ones. Um, and what happens is if you track a particle that starts somewhere, say, uh, if, you if you start here, uh, some particle in the bulk, right? And you see what it does, then what will it do? In the first step, it will hop to the left. Then in the next step, right, this particle is now here, right? It will hop with the blue line up, then we're now here, it will hop to the right, and then it will hop back to where it was. So this describes this kind of blue, uh, blue trajectory. So this particle will make a closed trajectory, 
and uh, a, uh, nothing interesting. On the other hand, if you put a, a boundary to this uh, system and you start from some particle that sits on the boundary, like this, say, red one, let's say here, right? So on the first step, it will jump to the one step to the right. Then, oh, then uh, there's nothing happening anymore, right? Because you don't turn on this coupling next. And then you, the next coupling is green, you'll turn another step to the right. Yeah? And again, um, uh, we'll, we'll stay there. So all in all, you moved from this black point to the next one, okay? So if you are on the edge, you are moving along. If you're in the bulk, you're just doing kind of closed orbits, a little bit like what we're used to think when we're thinking about the kind of uh, cyclotron orbits in the, in the case of the integer quantum hall. Um, and, uh, and really what it does is says that, okay, there are uh, localized states in the bulk for this evolution and then kind of extended states that carry transport on the boundaries. Um, the uh, analysis of all of these kind of Floquet systems goes through analysis of the evolution operator, U. Um, and you can, if the system is translationally invariant, you can invoke all of the regular things you're, you are used to doing in, in regular topological insulators. You take U, um, the evolution, it's now you can, it's diagonal in K because the system is translational invariant. You take uh, the log of U to get a, some kind of an effective Hamiltonian, which we call the Floquet Hamiltonian. And then uh, you can analyze the band structure of this Floquet Hamiltonian. This is what is normally done. Uh, what I'm going to show you is something similar, but where this, where we cannot do this uh, kind of technology because I'm going to look at evolution, which is non-unitary. Um, and let me then jump to the next step. So this is what we're going to do. We are going to do something very motivated by that, very similar, a, a, but it will give us something new. So uh, we want to get this kind of behavior. We'll start from a, a, some boring lattice. This lattice is called the Lieb lattice. Um, I mean, not boring, it's just kind of standard lattice, square lattice with these uh, extra sides. And we are going to be, the only thing, we're not going to be modulating the Hamiltonian. The only thing we're going to do is we're going to have a pattern of measurements, uh, of density measurements of particles, which we're going to do in a certain way that will uh, have a similar effect to the effect of turning on couplings one by one. Here is the protocol. Um, <clears throat> so we have, in this particular one, we have eight steps. And now let me explain what you see here. So we have the Lib lattice that I showed before. And at each step, I'm going to mark a set of red dots, which are places where I'm going to be measuring a, a density of particles. So I'm measuring particles in all of these red dots. Um, and as you can see, there is an area where I'm not measuring. There's this two black dots here, two black dots here, that I'm not doing any measurements. There, the system can kind of uh, evolve uninterrupted. Then I move the set where I'm doing the measurements. So there are these red dots, I then move this set along. And AI, so there are eight steps. AI uh, are the set that is not measured. So uh, here it's these black dots, here it's these black dots, and so on. And you continue like this in some kind of a chiral pattern. So uh, this, and um, then you don't measure this set and so on. At each step, we are also going to, so we are going to measure these red dots and we are not only measuring them once, we can measure them repeatedly uh, n times so that um, <clears throat> the time the system evolves between measurements is given by tau, which is the total time I'm doing the cycle divided by the number of steps, which is eight and divided by number of n, where n is the number of measurements per step. Okay? So that's, that's the definition of the system. And uh, 
I'm going to show you that this essentially does a similar job, or though in a quite different way of generating uh, a, a edge, edge uh, chi chiral edge behavior. <clears throat> So, uh, so first of all, I, I need some technology in order to, to do this. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes explaining <coughs> how we're analyzing the system. So what we're going to do is we're going to essentially, um, a, a, we're not going to look at the whole full quantum state or full density matrix of the system. Instead of that, we're going to look at only partial information that would be enough for us. So. Uh, the way to go through that is to think about um, a, a, a evolution of correlation functions. So there's an old, as old as uh, statistical mechanics, a, a way of trying to solve many body systems, which is uh, using hierarchies of correlation functions. So the famous example is of course uh, Boltzmann equation. So in the Boltzmann equation, F is the density of particles in a phase space, so in momentum and position. And uh, if you look at the derivative of this density of particles, it's uh, uh, equal to some collision integral. And now the collision integral is really something that knows about higher order correlation functions, right? Because it knows that there are two particles coming in and whatever, what's the joint distribution of two particles. Uh, this a uh, Boltzmann equation is of course just the kind of uh, 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 part of a big hierarchy of equations uh, often called BBKGY hierarchy. And uh, in this hierarchy, oh, in this hierarchy, the derivative of the uh, um, joint S particle uh, correlation function. So this is FS depends on uh, S uh, momentas and position. Uh, is given by some kind of thing that looks like Hamiltonian evolution plus something that depends on S plus correlation of S plus one particles. And that's why it's a hierarchy. So the S particles depend on S plus one particles, S plus one depends on S plus two and so on. And this goes to infinity and of course we cannot solve it. So the way uh, usually we go about it and that's the way we get the, the Boltzmann equation, we truncate this, uh, uh, this uh, hierarchy of equations at some point. Um, and so, uh, uh, um, so in the case of the Boltzmann, we just truncate it at the lowest level we, we can essentially. Now you can ask the following questions, question in, uh, a, and I'll give a part to the description of that in quantum mechanical systems where you evolve, um, where, where you are allowed to do um, things that are not just a Hamiltonian evolution. So let me describe what I mean by that. So I'm going to look at uh, right now at the following thing. It's a correlation function, kind of instantaneous equal time correlation function. A and A dagger are going to be, are just uh, fermionic operators associated with sites. R and R prime, and G R R prime T is just the uh, average with respect to whatever the density matrix is at time T of A dagger R A R prime, okay? Also known as the two-point function of correlation matrix and so on. And now you can ask what kind of uh, maps I can, what kind of things I can do that will result in a closed equation for this G. And I think I skipped the step. So let me just quickly go through that step. Uh, if I have a density mat quantum density matrix, uh, which is written here, uh, I can ask what are the most general things I can do to it that are, uh, will give me a new density matrix, right? So these are characterized by something called Krauss operators and a map like this, a Krauss map. I take rho to sum of A alpha rho, A alpha dagger, uh, and sum over alpha. And A alphas can be, whatever I like, uh, except that they need to uh, maintain a normalization condition like this. Okay. Any choice of a, a alpha that obeys this condition will give me a valid map of rho. And in fact, there is always a way of uh, generating these, uh, uh, this, kind of a set, this kind of an operation on rho. What happens to averages? Well, if I look at an average, 
right? Trace all row of O where O is some operator. Then after this Krauss map, uh, the average of O will go to an average of O dressed with this Krauss operators. A little bit like we have with Heisenberg evolution, just we average over many of them. Um, now, if you have a correlation function of many of these A and A daggers, you can ask what type of operations, what type of Krauss operators will give me hierarchies of equations connecting the, say, S point correlation function with the S plus one. Uh, so you can find answers to that in this paper that is cited below. In particular, for the, our purposes here, we are going to talk about uh, the two-point function. And I want to ask what operations can I do on the density matrix row that will uh, give me a closed equation for the two-point function. Okay. So, um, so one thing that we will use uh, a lot in this uh, particular talk is fermion detection at the site. So I'm going to measure the operator N alpha, which is the number operator of some site alpha, A dagger alpha A alpha. And if I look at the associated Krauss operators, what they turn out to be, the Krauss map is rho goes to N alpha rho N alpha plus one minus N alpha rho one minus N alpha. Uh, for fermions, N alpha is a projection operator. So this is all what this does is essentially says that the measurement uh, is kind of a decoherence in the basis of having a particle or not having a particle inside the alpha. It kills off diagonal terms. Um, and if you plug this in and look at how, G, so you take your G, right? And you plug the new row in and you follow through the, the canonical anti-commutation relations, you'll find that G before the measurement transforms as follows, take G, multiplied by a projection on the site alpha. This is now in the space of, uh, right? It's no longer in the many body space because G is just, a, right? It's just a indexed by the number of sites. Oh. Uh, and then uh, uh, add to it uh, one minus the projection times G times one minus the projection. Evolution goes like, the other example is free evolution. So. In general, right, if I have an evolution u, rho goes to u rho u dagger. If u involves interactions, right, then clearly uh, whenever I take uh, any kind of correlation functions with, with and compute the average with, with a given rho, uh, the, I'm not going to get a closed expression because u will generate for me higher and higher order correlation functions. But if the evolution is free, uh, meaning no interactions or only quadratic Hamiltonians, if you want, then we know that there is a simple evolution of the creation and relation operators according to this. Um, so they just live, evolve in a linear fashion. And in that case, uh, you can just plug this into uh, your G and you'll see that G just evolves as U, G, U dagger, right? So this is all, um, uh, nice stuff you can use and you can add to it uh, two more things so the i would say two is something that all of us have known in some way or another one may be a little bit less familiar and uh, another thing you can do is add a particle or extract the particle um here are the kind of beyond besides the non-interacting evolutions here, here are the things that you can do and how they affect on g so the simple it's a very simple uh, procedure so here is the G kind of before the operation. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure, is there a particle at site three? Okay, so what I told you is basically I'm killing off all of the correlation between sign three and everything else. So as a matrix, it, this G matrix will just go into something like that where I just put zero in all of the elements that are not G, uh, that involve three and some other site. And now I can also do the following. I can insert a particle at site three. This is essentially equivalent to measuring whether there is a particle there. And then if there isn't one, you put it there. So, uh, and it turns out all it does is this. You just put one where uh, for G33. And you can also extract a particle. And what it does, again, it kills the uh, 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 off-diagonal correlations and then it extracts the particle. There are also other 
possibilities, but these are what we are going to use. Um, so now uh, let's see. Uh, um, so this is some technology that allows us to, to deal with doing these measurements, at least on the level of the two point uh, uh, function. I want to mention that uh, these uh, unitary evolution and extraction and insertion of particles is essentially universal in the sense that you can get from any initial G to any final G by doing a set of operations like that. How do you do that? So the proof is very simple. You start from a given G, then you start removing particles until you removed all of the particles and made the G to be zero, right? And then uh, uh, you add particles into the appropriate uh, sites or appropriate uh, uh, modes you want to do by using a combination of inserting particles and doing unitaries. Um, so the object G, so we're going to look at maps of this G, of this two-point function. It's, the, it's a different object than the, what we're used to when we're talking about uh, maps of the density matrix. Because uh, for example, G doesn't have to be normalized. It can, have, it can go to zero and so on. It needs to be Hermitian. Uh, and, and it needs to be positive, but it doesn't have to obey many of the things that, that row has to obey. Okay, so, um, uh, so here you can see a few mention of a few, there are many, many works uh, doing various use of, uh, in recent years of these kind of hierarchy ideas. Um, now I'm going to go back to the protocol that I described and I'll tell you how we deal with that. Okay. Israel, could I jump in before you go back just on this intro part? Yeah. Noah sure. Brayali. Uh, I, so, I know. Hey, Israel. Hey. Shalom. Oh. This is a density matrix crowd, you know. And so in, in, in the way of thinking, you just mentioned the density matrix and truncation. When we do density matrix renormalization, we truncate the density matrix for interacting systems, of course, in one dimension, that's the catch, right? Yeah. Or, you know, quasi one dimensions. So you go in two dimensions, but you're kind of going free on us. I wanted to see if we can make a little contact with this truncation that, of course, we all learned in statistical mechanics. I remember Joel giving a lecture that I, I, I studiously ignored in grad school about this hierarchy with all those letters that you mentioned. And even mm -hmm. as, uh, with, gun, with Gunpathy, we we're doing Quantum Hall, and I remember ignoring this hierarchy yeah. stuff, thinking, there's no way this is going to work, you know? And of course, you know, it doesn't quite work, but it's, it's good enough and all that. But I'm trying to make a connection. So when we think of the density matrix truncation we do in one dimension with these matrix product states, what we do is kind of, uh, we look at the entanglement spectrum and we keep a, some finite amount of states, the ones that dominate the density matrix, and then grow the system. I wonder if this truncation in particle number, the S, if that particle number truncation can somehow morally be equi equi equivalent to this um, one dimension truncation that's or related in some way. Yeah, okay, so, so that, thanks for the very interesting question. I, uh, I would say that the, one could probably invent some connection, but it's certainly not uh, the obvious one. So there is, um, in particular, a, like we said, this can work in any dimension. Uh, there is no restriction of how much entanglement you can have in the system, uh, in fact, any um, any uh, you you can get to any density matrix, or at least well, a large su subset of density matrices by doing this subset of operations. The trick here is um, is that yeah, I mean, in some sense, we are killing certain correlations. We are killing correlations beyond beyond Wick's theorem. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to exactly connect it to uh, entanglement directly. Um, so, uh, so it's a, thanks for the question. Maybe I'll think about it later. Okay, the, is that helpful? Well, I, maybe I, just to um, yeah. uh, so in terms of entanglement, right? With, we think about entanglement usually um, as as the uh, the failure of the computational basis. You know, we work in a computational basis that's yeah. local in in, in space, yeah. right? And these projections that you're doing, the n alphas, they're local in space. They project onto what we call computational basis. Yeah. So it seems almost by definition you're you're kind of killing some of the entanglement. 
to get your hierarchy to close. What, what I'm doing is I'm basically, uh, if you want, if right now I'm not doing any approximations, by the way, I'm already assuming that I'm only using the things that are hierarchy is closed. But if I were to do trans, truncations, which is actually done all the time in physics, then, uh, then I would say, um, uh, yeah, then, then, then what I'm doing is I'm kind of, in a sense, looking for the closest Gaussian state to, 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 uh, to some interacting problem. But let me, let me uh, for the sake of time, move on. Move on, yeah. And, uh, uh, but thanks, thanks for the question. In, in any case, uh, a part of the moral of the story here is that density metrics can be extremely complicated, but behavior of... Uh, the two-point function can be, still be simple. And that's the one that we most physically are interested in. So, um, so, so, so let me, okay, so let me go back then to the protocol. So again, I explained that what we're doing is we are measuring the red sites and not measuring right now the, in step one, the green sites and step two, the blue site and so on, right? And then we evolve uh, while, periodically still measuring the red side. So the protocol is written here on the left. And because all we are doing is free evolution with the lib lattice hopping and measurements, this falls into the category of this closed hierarchy. So at least numerically, it's very, very easy to try and start from a G and just iterate it with this simple matrix. Uh, multiplications that are not scaling exponential with simple system size. Uh, now, how does G evolve under all of this? So uh, it's convenient to think about uh, uh, at least, I mean, numerically you just multiply matrices, but uh, if you want to do any analytics, it's a little bit convenient right now to look at it from a super operator point of view. It's not the super operator that people talk about when they talk about dressing up pro. It's kind of a super operator for G, right? So if I start from G, which is a matrix like that, I can write it as a vector in a doubled space. And then this kind of operation like evolution, right? Uh, is, uh, are, are written as simple tensor products of evolution. Measurement is given by, uh, by some projection uh, PR. And if you want to measure many sites simultaneously, there's also a super operator for that. Uh, if you are given a uh, region A where you are measuring, there is a super operator describing that measurement. And nicely, if you have a region A where you're measuring and a region B where you're measuring, um, then the result of the product of the measurements is, is this. Now, um, now, what do we do? So uh, in our protocol, we are going to take G and a time starting from time T, then we are going to do all of this cycle of evolutions uh, and measurements. So a time T plus capital T, which is the time it takes to do the whole cycle, we go to some super operator lambda times G and lambda looks like this. So there are eight steps, each of them characterized by the set not measured, A1, A2, and so on until A8. Uh, PA1, actually, sorry, PA1 is the projection on the things, not uh, is the set that describes projection on the complement of A1. I'm sorry about that, it's labeling. Then I evolve and I repeat that n times and, and that's, that's, the, that's the thing, right? It looks a little bit complicated, but soon we are going to find nice stuff about it. Um, so uh, to get nice stuff, the best thing to do, of course, is always to take a limit, right? So, uh, so the nicest limit to take in this case is going to be the limit of rapid measurements, of many rapid measurements. And this has a nice history, it called, it's, uh, goes by the name of the Zeno effect. I'm sure uh, all of you have heard about that, um, where Zeno, uh, <clears throat> Zeno Ephelia had these paradoxes where he says, well, if I, if I can look at an error at an instant in time and it's just there, then how could it be moving when it's kind of static at the, any given instant of time? There's lots of philosophers worked on that. 
quantum mechanics gives an answer to that. But I think another way of thinking about it, which I like, is just that this means that physics really needs phase space. It's so the position of the arrow is not sufficient. You need also the velocity of the arrow at each given point of time. Anyway, so uh, uh, so that's the Zeno effect, and of course there is a quantum Zeno effect that has to do with measurements. And uh, one thing I was I learned preparing for this talk, which I did not appreciate before, is that actually that was discovered by Turing. I didn't know that Turing was interested in quantum mechanics at all. Apparently, he was for uh, a little bit of time enough to make a, a, a pretty amazing discovery. So this is called sometimes Turing paradox. Uh, and the statement is that <clears throat> if you take a system and measure it all the time, then you are prohibiting it from evolving, right? So if you have an unstable particle and you keep checking, is it there, is it there, is it, did it decay, did it decay or not? If you do it very rapidly, it will not decay. Right? That's the kind of physical implication of that. Uh, the term uh, quant quantum Zeno uh, was, was uh, termed by Suda, Shan, and Misra. And there's been all kinds of works on that, including experimental uh, verification of the effect. So that's a nice limit to be in. And here it is in a nutshell. I'm going to explain it. Uh, uh, so let's say you start from a state phi. Uh, uh, and you ask, what is the probability to stay in the same state when you evolve with Hamiltonian H? Right? So you start from phi, you evolve with H, and you want to know what's the probability of getting back to phi. So it's this expression. Now assume t is very small, so that we can kind of expand e to the minus i h t. Uh, you'll have the linear term and the quadratic term, and when you put it in uh, and uh, uh, to second order, you'll find that this result is one minus something like goes like t squared delta h squared is just the variance of h in the state phi. So, but the important thing it goes like t little t squared, right? Now, if you evolve during a long time, capital T, right? And you check every, and you do the measurement every uh, n, little n times, right? So this evolution T where you are in between the measurement goes like capital T over n. And then, well, if you'll put, uh, if, if you'll put uh, the little T, which is capital T over n, right here and, uh, and it goes like one over n squared. So even if you repeat it n times in the limit that n goes to infinity, this goes to one, which means that the probability to stay in the state phi is one. Yeah, uh, And that's the quantum, quantum uh, uh, Zeno effect. So we expect that uh, uh, something like that to, to also take place here. And that kind of was the motivation for, for this, uh, uh, for this uh, direction of thought. So lipid, limit of uh, rapid uh, uh, monitoring. So now what I'm doing is I'm in the limit where I'm monitoring if there are particles in all of these red states very rapidly. Checking every, every nanosecond, is there a particle or not? Uh, and, uh, and I do that for a while, then I jump to the next a set of measurements and so on in, in, the, in this kind of Carl uh, form. Uh, so uh, let me define. So U is the, just the free evolution without measurements, without anything. UA would be an evolution where I only turn on the hoppings, you see, uh, uh, in the sites that are not being measured to give for a given A. Uh, now, you, if you expand for large n, large frequency of, uh, of measurements, you'll find that this uh, evolution in this Zeno limit is given by, so the measurements are still out, you can take them out and only allow evolution inside the region that not, is not being measured. And that brings you to something which is almost exactly what the Rudner et al model was, except that, so, except that our super operator here is not just unitary stuff. There are still the measurements when I do when I switch from one uh, one step in the evolution to the second. Then I have this extra measurement that's sitting there. Okay, so in that it is different. Okay, um, now it turns out that this Zeno limit leads to a classical stochastic evolution uh, in the following way. 
basically because we keep measuring all the time uh, very rapidly all of the red states, right? Uh, uh, um, we are killing non-trivial correlations or off-diagonal terms, if you want, between these sites and everything else. So if you just look at the diagonal part of G, uh, which are the densities, uh, these densities turn out to obey a stochastic evolution according to a cycle. And in this cycle, there are eight steps uh, associated with the steps of this, uh, of our measurement cycle. Uh, and so in the step one, right, if I start from a particle here, I'll, uh, I, I let it evolve to the other side. There's some probability for it to hop or not hop. Let's call this probability P, right? So for each of these, I have some transition matrix that looks like that. Uh, so it's a stochastic mat matrix, in fact, bi-stochastic bi matrix that uh, responsible for this step. And then you would just kind of take the product of them. Uh, the probability of, ju of jumping is uh, a sine squared of t over eight, where t is the total time. Um, so that's that's uh, that's the Zeno limit. Now let's see what that gives us. We're going to measure the flow uh, in this system, which is essentially classical. Uh, one convenient way of doing it is using a counting field. So every time you so so if this is your system, every time you jump to the left, you can add the phase e to the i theta. And when you jump to the right, you add e to the minus i theta. You can use that to build a, a kind of moment generating function or characteristic function. And then the flow per unit length would be the derivative of this generating function with respect to this counting angle at angle equal zero. And this, this object you can study. Um, uh, both numerically and analytically. Um, so first of all, the nicest or the simplest case is of course, when what we call perfect switching. That's when we take this P equal one. And that's, that's the case where we are kind of exactly in the same ballpark as this Rudner et al paper. Uh, uh, and, and indeed, if you look at the flow, per, then everything is deterministic at that point, because if you start from some point, Right, you hop with probability one to the next point in the cycle, and everything that was happening in, in that previous model is, is happening here. You can look at the flow and it's integer um, and, and, and so on. Now, what if you are not at this perfect switching limit? Uh, you can in fact prove a bulk edge decomposition. You can, well, you can prove that you can write the flow per cycle in terms of an object that doesn't know anything about uh, the boundary uh, and a plus something that naively looks like it knows about details of the boundary but in fact one can prove that that one doesn't even care about that and uh, so so there's the whole story here that i cannot get into because uh, that will take all of the talk uh, but the point is, you add these two contributions, which you compute in K space, and you can prove rigorously uh, uh, this formula, F bar plus F edge, uh, and then you can even compare it to simulation. So a simulation here is you actually do this. So you take a, a big lattice, right? Uh, you fill up half of it. So, so you, you fill, say, the lower half of the lattice, and you let it evolve according to the rules that I gave. So you evolve, measure, evolve, measure by multiplying many, many matrices and you, you compute the flow. And uh, you can see the uh, agreement between our formula and this simulation is, is essentially perfect. Um, uh, now, uh, this is something, by the way, I just today, I, 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 I was talking with Matt and we figured out how to prove that uh, that this is uh, robust to any disturbance on the boundary, which is actually remarkable because it's not an integer. Um, uh, so you do anything you want on the boundary and the flow will still be, be exactly the same numerically. It's not an integer, it, it, 
it smoothly depends on this parameter p, but, uh, but it's robust. Um, okay, so uh, uh, you can do a comparison from, with Floquet. Um, the, it's not that interesting, so I'll skip it in order to talk about other things. So, um, so first of all, if we already understand the Zeno limit, then we can look away from the Zeno limit. And uh, there's a simulation here and you see as, so this is the flow per cycle uh, um, as function of the log of the number of, of, of this frequency, if you want, of measurements. And uh, if I do no measurements that there is no flow, it's just the lib lattice and there's nothing happening there, interesting. Uh, and, um, but if I'm, as I crank up the, the measurements, I'm going to to some finite value, one if it's perfect uh, switching. Uh, you can do a near Zeno expansion and actually analytically they get this curve, which is actually pretty good up to some point. Um, so you do that by essentially uh, changing a little bit this transition matrices that I told you about. Here is how the typical numerics looks like, right? So you fill up the system, half the system, right? We can, if we fill up the entire system, we will get no flow because the current, because it's a chiral thing. So the current going below will go, will cancel by current going above. Uh, so we fill half the system and then let it evolve. And during that evolution, we, we monitor the, where the particles are going. Um, and uh, that's um, what is done there. You can do other lattices, by the way, a simpler one with only six steps. And, uh, and I think that's right. So that's, that's a good time to stop with this system. Um, and I can come back to it in the end. Um, so again, it's a chiral edge transport, which is done only by doing pattern of measurements. Um, okay, so in the next example, using essentially the same type of, well, it's at least set a similar starting point is uh, quantum wakes. So what are quantum wakes? So uh, first of all, what are wakes? So many of you have heard about the fact that if you look at a duck swimming in a pond, or you're looking at a speedboat in the bay, uh, or you look at, I don't know, Bezos' yacht in the sea, you'll probably have see behind them a wake and the wake will have a um, universal angle behind it. Um, and that was kind of a famous result of Kelvin. So that's Kelvin's uh, result. I, um, and uh, interestingly enough, I, uh, in the last few years, people were kind of re-examining it in some other situations because uh, some people analyzed Google pictures of uh, a Google pictures of uh, of uh, big ships at sea, and you could actually just from the picture you can analyze what is the angle behind the ships, and they saw deviation from from Kelvin result due to various effects that have to do with size and so on. And uh, that kind of rekindled interest in this business. Uh, my colleague here, uh, Eugene Kolomeisky, uh, wrote a nice paper about um, wakes in two-dimensional Fermi C's. So you take a two-dimensional Fermi C, you take a potential and kind of move it at constant velocity. And you want to ask what is the pattern of, uh, of uh, density variation behind this uh, thing? And uh, a, and uh, you can see some deviations from the from the usual Kelvin story, but and, and everything is analyzed in this nice uh, this rev letter. Um, what I was interested in is to see what can one do in the discrete case, and also if you add kind of unusual things like measurement or stuff like that. So you can imagine maybe a lattice of uh, called atoms, and you are measuring or extracting or, add, or do, doing something with, with atoms along there and moving the point where you're doing that. So say you are measuring the density of particles at the point or a small region, and then you move that along. Okay. What will that do? And um, 
So, uh, uh, so how do we describe it? Again, we can do numerics and we can do analytics. So the rule of the game is again, I'm going to take this tip and move it from side to side where I do something like measurement or interacting potential or something like that. In between the time the tip moves to the other uh, point, I will see that the particles just evolve without interactions. Okay. So that kind of gives it, brings it into the technology that I, I can use with this uh, closed hierarchy thing. Um, so, uh, so how do I describe the potential wake uh, or, or any other wake? I'm going to do, well, let's, let's start with potential. Potential means I'm moving a potential along this lattice. So I'm going to try to, uh, to write a steady state equation in the co-moving frame, right? So I imagine that I did it for a long, long time and now there is this pattern developed in the moving frame. What would that mean? That would mean that G will be the same as what I will see a moment later, but also moved. So S is a shift operator along the direction of motion. This is the evolution while I'm moving the tip from side to side, and this is my original G, and then that should be invariant if I am in some kind of a steady state in the co-moving frame. So you can write this equation and analyze it. It's quite interesting uh, an ex interesting uh, exercise. Um, you can kind of solve it uh, almost completely in the case of half filling, uh, uh, where the Fermi, the, the initial distribution of particles is just this kind of a diamond in a square lattice. Um, and describe the, uh, the wake pattern. So the wake pattern, oh, the wake pattern is given by some directions and you can identify these directions. They depend on the velocity of the, um, essentially on the velocity of the, of the object moving in, in units that know about the energy, uh, the, the hopping energy and the time. Um, so the potential wakes, there are other things that you can do. So for example, you can take now a detector and move it along and analyze this problem. So uh, again, using the same type of tools and you'll find that uh, interestingly enough, uh, the pattern will depend uh, uh, very strongly on the filling, uh, on how many particles per unit site you have. At half filling, you have no, no, uh, uh, no pattern. That's due to some kind of particle hole uh, behavior. Uh, and, uh, but anything else you'll give a wake, which is just due to the fact that you made a measurement. Um, you can also do finite temperature. Uh, there we find a kind of surprising result. You can do it for, so here it's just moving a potential and do it in, in finite temperature, oh, sorry. And this one is, uh, um, a, oh, I didn't write which are the temperatures, sorry. Uh, the, 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 ne the next uh, row shows the uh, wake behind the extraction. You're taking a particle and extracting it. Um, and it turns out that that one in, at half filling is independent of temperature, which was kind of a surprise. And you can then prove that that must be so because uh, because of because of the detection uh, and particle hole symmetry, uh, the the wake you'll get is somewhat depending on the basis in which you measure. So if you measure the presence of a particle at the site, that's one thing. You will not get any wake, say at half filling. But if you measure, say, is there a particle at the symmetric combination of a site and say some other site next to it, right? At that mode, then you might get uh, um, a, a wake pattern. Um, so, okay, so I'm, 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 I guess I, 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 I gave you the main, main thing that we found about these wakes. Uh, and so now let me tell you about the, where we are with, uh, with uh, these projects. So, um, so let me. So so mostly we are thinking about the this uh, floque uh, this not floque this uh, measure I would call it measurement induced chirality. So in this system that we have, 
Uh, and we have right now other systems we can do that, but you, um, uh, the thing that induces chirality is actually the, the pattern of measurements rather than anything else. And uh, you can ask various questions. It's a, two, it's a two dimensional system. One thing you can ask is what does this order do? Uh, this, of course, there are countless papers about uh, what does this order do in, in, in transport and in, in two dimensional systems. This one is a little bit special. So, uh, we're still working on that. We have uh, lots of numerics and we're seeing a transition. One might expect a transition also between having a flow and not having a flow. And that what kind of disorder you can add is also different a little bit because you can add the usual disorder, which is potential disorder, but you can also add a different type of disorder. You can say, well, maybe some percentage of the detectors are not working, something like that, right? And, uh, and see whether or not you get a different, uh, uh, um, a different transition point in say in this uh, par with this parameter p. Um, so this is something we are working on. We see the transition. We don't have a good understanding of it yet. And the other thing, right, is interactions. So of course, what I told you about uh, is the the technology, especially in the Zeno limit. Is I mean, sorry, the technology depends on not having interaction. But you can think maybe if you combine the Zeno limit. With interactions, you can still do something, and in fact, uh, in fact, we have nice results. We haven't written it yet, but you can, by adding interactions, you can find special. Uh, you you can, if the interaction strength of the interactions is is tuned to certain points, uh, you can completely block the flow. Uh, so. Uh, uh, can talk about it more, uh, more if anyone wants. Um, and that actually holds not only for our system, but also for the regular flow cam. And, and, uh, other things we are thinking about, of course, what I told you about is the evolution of the two point function. So it just tells you about the average, but of course you can ask what is the statistics beyond that average? What are the variances, right? So when I said that there is no wake behind the detector at half filling, it doesn't mean that the detector, when you do detection at half filling, you're not doing anything. You are detecting and you are doing some collapse of the wave function and all of that. It just will not be seen in an, in, on average. You'll have to go beyond average. Uh, another thing we're talking about. So I, I mentioned that the system is very robust. We have a bulk edge correspondence. What we don't have is a topological, uh, we don't have an integer. We don't have a number, I mean, uh, beyond saying something like, oh, if I just look at the number of, uh, I, I don't know, a design of the flow, that would be an integer and that would be robust, but it somehow doesn't feel like, feel quite right. And however, it's the system is actually very strongly protected against certain things. So really, if you take this uh, system and, and add potential, do whatever you like, uh, um, um, basically, uh, as long as you do it not everywhere in the bulk, the flow will stay the same. At least in the Zeno limit, we can prove that. Um, and um, I, other things I want to mention, we have an experimentalist that is also working on this uh, quantum wakes. So hopefully we'll be able to to see this kind of quantum wakes in cold atoms um, in maybe a year or something like that. I, I, I wanted to mention that a, what I described is true for fermions, but you can do similar things for bosons, not all the way, but at least uh, the measurement, it's not injection or extraction, but the measurement, uh, a, 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 if you, if you measure the number of bosons at the site and you average all of, uh, all of that results, it will yield a very similar um, map on G, essentially the same map on G. And that's something you can prove. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's roughly the story I have, I have for you today. Um, I'll be happy to, to try and answer questions. Yeah, uh, 
That was a very, very interesting talk. So, yep, that's a good time for questions. If anybody would like to uh, ask, go ahead and just unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. May I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Oh, thank you for the interesting talk. I have two questions to ask. The first one is like, it is really interesting that the, ball, no, no, the edge state is robust, even though there you put in perturbation. Mm -hmm. Is it because like, is it because of some kind of symmetry or something, or do you have any understanding of why this is robust? Um, I, I, I would say it's robust to, um, um, so you, you need to make some assumptions. So for example, it would not be robust to adding like a net current in the bulk, right? So if you, you know, add something that, that really preferentially takes particles somewhere in the bulk that will not be robust to that, of course, uh, or in the edge or anywhere. Um, but it's, I wouldn't say that's a proper symmetry. Um, uh, so the, the, the real answer is that I don't know I, I don't know. It's a little bit more like if I, uh, if you ask, you know, the flux, for example, of the charge uh, here, right, is robust. So the the, the flux of an electric electro electric current through a sphere is robust to adding anything that has no sources inside the sphere, right? So anything that have dV equals zero will not change this flux. Maybe something like that, but I don't. Uh, I don't have a good handle of that. Um, the thing that is a little bit unusual is that this flow is really uh, given in terms of uh, a of a point in the k equals zero point in the Brillouin zone. Uh, whilst usually we have, you know, if you have a if you want a topological invariant, you'd better have an integral uh, and. Uh, we can, of course, R is a, this, uh, sorry, this uh, transition matrix is periodic in K-space if you have, so you can, you can cook up some integral that will give you an integer. I just don't have any clue of it, if it has any kind of uh, physical meaning. Uh, on the other hand, the thing that I do understand the meaning, the flow, I can, I, I can prove bulk edge decomposition. I can prove that it only depends on the bulk. Uh, 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 these kind of things, but I don't, I don't have a number in the, I, I don't have a churn class to associate it. Now that's probably because I don't know enough about churn class, <laughs> but, uh, but that's, that's where it is now. And I, I'm, I hopefully someone will figure it out soon. Uh, thank you. And then the second question is about the wake. Mm -hmm. And my guess, the wake is like a lot connected to the quasi particle of the system. I think mm -hmm. you are yes. giving the wake from the ground state. Yeah. Like, so the first, is it like, does it have like connected to the statistics of a particle or and, and also? Oh, uh, not in this case, uh, but it is uh, connected to, certainly to the symmetry of the lattice. Um, mm -hmm. So let me uh, maybe say something like this. If I, did I have? Okay, so the, in these examples, uh, I didn't really write what they were, but this is, if you run the simulation, you start from the particle on the left side and then let it move. Uh, and the difference between these simulations is the speed by which you are moving. So this one is fast, the, the left one is fast and this one is slow. In the slow one, the slower you get, you'll see that you're developing kind of like an X pattern. And then of course, all of you will say, well, that's because there's a D wave symmetry hiding here, right? So, I'm, so if I'm really slowing it down, then I will be really talking to the D wave symmetry of the excitations in the system. Uh, I don't know if that helps or not, uh, but uh, a, uh, another another way to engage with is, is with your question, of course, is that uh, um, in the 
if you forget about the lattice and you just do continuum description, right? Mm -hmm. Then really the, all, all the information does sit in the dispersion relation of the excitations. And that's how you get the usual Kelvin wake. And that's also in uh, Kolomeisky's paper, that's what they do. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you can write an equation, right? Uh, it's, it's a kind of a um, Mach Kelvin condition that, that tells you, uh, so, if you look at the, let me, if you look at the, this is the induced, if you look at this, this, this will show essentially the induced density, mm -hmm. at some point given as an integral where what sits inside is the um, external source and how it moves. Mm -hmm. And this is the, re the response function. You see the response okay. function below. So the poles of the response function, of course, will, will tell you how to, Will be will 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 tell you where are the where you where you need to look in phase space in order to to uh, to analyze this uh, the density variation. And, and is the wake pattern is the same for gapped spin liquid space? Like they also so, right. so if you if you were in a gapped system, right? Then in principle wow. you shouldn't get right. You don't have propagating uh, excitation. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't really get a wake like that. Maybe you, uh, yeah. If you have a gap and if you move really fast, then it maybe doesn't have a wake. Right. So the same, the same. Right. Even if you're not gapped, in fact, and you're moving very fast, at some point, if you move much faster than the excitations in the system, then you are in the Mach yeah. region. Uh, mm -hmm. It looks different. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's an excellent uh, point. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, can I ask a question about the first part of the talk? Yeah, sure. Um, so for this, um, uh, I wonder how general is this? So this, this system is chosen pretty, um, uh, so, so I, I'm assuming that the geometry doesn't really matter. The geometry of how you chose this uh, um, here is what you don't measure. So yeah, yeah. So uh, we are getting to it now because we are finally nailed down why, uh, why the flow doesn't really depend on details. Um, ah, okay. Uh, and and uh, this is just like a development from the last few days. Okay. Um, I see, I see. But, 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 uh, but yeah, I mean, essentially, well, uh, even in the paper, we, we kind of say, uh, we give a list of criterions for doing it. I mean, you can always, you can easily generate a lattice that will be able to, do that with a given pattern of measurements. And, and somehow you're choosing this lattice. Uh, uh, wh why did we choose this lattice? Yes. lattice? Yes. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, because um, it's the simplest one that we could find that looks almost exactly like this uh, Rudner one. Ah, okay. Because it's easier to, it's easy to um, interest people if it's something they've always- I see. Uh, but the other thing I want to ask was about adding interaction and how much things you can like keep, how much technology you can keep. Do you have any comments? Right, so I was hopeful in the beginning that I'll be, if I'll take the Zeno limit plus interaction, mm -hmm. that's some, some kind of a limit that people have not really considered and uh, that things will be uh, much simplified. And some things do simplify in that limit, uh, but so you can do a little bit more elaborate numerics, but it doesn't, it's not enough to, um, it's not, it, yeah, there's, the, the, it's, unfortunately it's not a free latch. You cannot mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, say, well, if I take Zeno plus interactions, then the problem is still polynomial in space rather mm -hmm. than exponential. Like I, would, like I honestly wanted to treat interactions. Uh, but what you, you can do is you can prove that in certain, there are certain interactions uh, that will, uh, uh, um, will kill the flow or do things like that, that, that you can, and, um, but, but, but that, that's not, we did some numerics. So Matt did some numerics where he in, involved interactions and were, was in the Zeno limit. And then what you need to do what you can do, in fact, which you, uh, which the Zeno limit does buy you, is you can track, um, 
you can try to track a, a kind of a trajectory of measurement patterns. So if you measured, you know, a, a certain particles in certain locations, conditioned on that, you can do the evolution, the next step of the evolution, this kind of stuff you can do. But still the uh, complexity does grow exponential eventually. I see, okay, thanks a lot, thanks a lot. Any other questions? Like I was very clear. I yeah, think. Oh, very important. Very, very nice. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, excellent yeah. talk. Thank you very much for uh, giving it to us, and we will. Yeah, we'll yeah, see you thanks, all. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening, guys. All right. Bye, bye, everybody. Right. Uh, yeah. Can you? Yeah. Is Adrian around or you went to teach? Ah, oh, yeah, Adrian's here. Uh, but yeah, we can. We can. Oh yeah. Chat. Well, I'll talk to him later then.